हेलो सर हेलो हेलो उदीना उदीना आदिति चौहान प्लीज विल 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 प्रेबली म्यूट एवरीबॉडी या कैन यू गिव मी द होस्ट वी वी शुड म्यूट एवरीवन Yes, ma'am. Yes.
Hello. Hello, ma'am. Hello.
Hello, Adam. Good evening, Suchitana. Yeah, great. Evening. Great. So uh, five more minutes, I guess, and then we will start. Let's great. See. So... Just to let you know, Suchitana, I, uh, I don't have a big enough screen that it's easy for me to monitor the chat window at the same time as I present. That's, a, that's not a problem. I think we will have uh, somebody to monitor the chat window. So questions will be questions and other things we can direct after the talk. Is that, is that right, organizers? That, that sounds good to me. Yep, great, we'll do that. Hi, Adam. Can you hear me? Hi, Redban. How are you? <laughs> Good. I haven't talked to you for a while. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> so everything is good, I, it seems, from, from your website. <laughs> Every, everything is good, yes. Obviously, the world has got a little crazy for everyone in the last year and a half, but yes. so, so far, so good. Have you started uh, teaching offline? I've been teaching fully remotely. Okay. Um, yeah. Because so, yeah, yeah. most mostly because the 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 course I teach is um, the course I teach is extremely well set up to be taught remotely anyway. It's a programming course. Okay. Um, so I, I actually had some students comment last year that they didn't see any reason for it to be in person. Right. So. Yeah, the programming course is probably the one of the. <laughs> more one of the easiest to you know teach online except the exams then become um yeah you, you have to somehow give them questions that they have to uh i guess harder questions <laughs> so that, yeah, yeah yeah you're right and the, the ideal but perverse way of doing it i think would for it would for it, would be for it to be online but then have exams in person but that seemed a little <laughs> Yes, you have to come in person three times a year just for exams. That, you're right, that would be a, probably the best setup. And I, I never checked Suchitana. I, I was planning for about 40 minutes just because that's, that's normal. <laughs> but I don't think you ever gave me a, a, a time. So hopefully about 40 minutes. Yes, well. I think 40 minutes is perfect. I mean, you can even go for 45 if you if it seems like that. Uh, is that right, Suchitana? I think she's doing something else. Um, oh, are you looking for me, Ritubad? Yeah, maybe I should start my yes. video a little bit. Yes, Hello, so Adam, was, Adam was asking uh, if 40 minutes is okay. So I said that's fine and even 45 minutes is yeah, fine that's well. right yeah 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 and uh, then we can have the questions yeah great but by the way Suchitana and Ritaban, this is a this is a turtle rock coffee mug <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> which they gave they gave me for free about six or seven years ago and oh wow I always they couldn't have known the pandemic was coming, but whenever I'm being recorded, now there's a turtle rock coffee mug in the foreground. So. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great, yeah. We used to have a sort of uh, group meeting, I mean, without you, just us. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> in there. So maybe we should, have, we should have bought one or gotten one before we left. <laughs> it's, not, it's not too late, we hope. <laughs> Yeah. We can we'll all travel again at some point, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, so it exactly start at 8.30. I guess uh, whoever the host is, they will... Yes, yeah. ma'am. We'll start so, at 8.30. So should Thank I just uh, start introducing at 8.30? No, or? no, no, I guess, I guess they have some. I think Garima oh. is the... Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So it's already 8.30. And a very good evening and a warm welcome to Presidency Physics Summit, Precision 2021. I am your host for today. My name is Garima Rajguru. Today we have come 
to the last lap of precision 2021 the public lecture and our energy just keeps on increasing today we have with us renowned professor adam myers chairing this session will be dr ritovan chatterjee our professor at presidency university may i request all of you to keep your mics on mute and switch off your videos i would now request uh, Dr. Ritogan Chatterjee to proceed with the session. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so uh, I think I'll just uh, introduce Adam without, uh, without any other delay. So we are delighted to have Professor Adam Myers of University of Wyoming as our speaker today. Adam did his PhD from University of Durham in England in 2004 which has one of the best programs in computational cosmology and high energy astrophysics in the world. Then as many British astrophysicists do, he crossed the small water body named the Atlantic Ocean. And he uh, joined University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. He was a postdoc and then a research scientist there till 2011. Uh, in 2011, he became a faculty member at the Department of Physics at University of Wyoming. Although in the first two years uh, from 2011 to 13, he was a Humboldt Fellow at Max Planck Institute, Heidelberg. Since 2012, 13, Adam has been in Wyoming. Adam is an expert on constraining cosmological parameters and quasar properties using data from large astronomical surveys, as well as designing and executing such surveys. Now to talk about Adam's research, I have to tell you a little bit about SDSS. So in the early 90s, Princeton astronomer Jim Gunn, who had previously designed the WFPC camera of the Hubble Space Telescope, had a brilliant idea. He realized that with the then newly available CCD technology, a sensitive, wide field, cleverly designed camera, even on an average telescope, can survey the sky very efficiently such that the images and spectra of a million galaxies may be obtained within a few years, which was unthinkable before that time. His idea caught on the imagination of the astronomical community and such a camera was made and survey started in the year 2000, being partially funded by the Sloan Foundation. This survey was called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or SDSS. As predicted, Within a few years, it mapped the location of galaxies in the universe with unprecedented details to partially quote Anne Finkbeiner, who wrote an excellent popular level book on SDSS. With a million galaxies, one could make a map showing where galaxies lived and whether they lived near other galaxies or their locations are completely random and whether little chains of galaxies were actually part of a larger network and whether that network is actually a network of networks and how big it all got. One could also make a true census, how galaxies differed from each other, how young galaxies changed as they grew, what kinds of galaxies they grew into. With a million galaxies, one could watch the universe growing up. Within a 10 years of operation, there were more papers written using SDSS than that, of, that by Hubble. In other words, SDSS has more impact on astrophysics and cosmology than the mighty Hubble Space Telescope. However, obtaining physically meaningful information from survey data is an extremely non-trivial task. That is where Adam comes in. Adam is among the first generation of astronomers who used SDSS data to fully realize its potential. In particular, he has made seminal contribution in probing the large scale structure and constraining the cosmological properties of the universe using large maps of quasars obtained from SDSS. Adam has focused on quasars because they are the brightest sources and one can survey the largest volume of the universe using them. The success of astronomers like Adam to extract crucial cosmological and astrophysical information from SDSS data has ushered in an era of survey-based astronomy. It became clear that large and unbiased samples of galaxies or quasars or any group of celestial objects for that matter can provide very important information that observations of individual objects just cannot. Adam has been in the forefront, forefront of planning, designing and utilizing multiple such surveys 
which provide or plan to produce maps of the universe, which are an order of magnitude or more better than the original SDSS. Today, Adam, I believe, will talk about one such survey named DESI. Now, finally, since this is, a, this is a session of the precision, which is a conference of the undergraduate students, by the undergraduate students, and for the undergraduate students, I should talk about teaching as well. Adam loves to teach. He has taught many courses, both in Urbana-Champaign and in Wyoming. He's an outstanding teacher who has never scored less than 90% in any of his teaching evaluations, it seems. Uh, from the data. He has a large fan following on ratemyprofessor.com because of his clarity of exposition and humor and kindness. I'm sure after today, he would have several additional fans from India as well. So I have already taken up some time. So without further delay, please, Adam, uh, start. Thank you. Thank you, Ritaban, for that far too kind introduction. Um, and very, <laughs> very extensive. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Jim Gunn. I, I think it is, there is a, as you said, there's a generation of people who have come through with these large surveys. And there were probably dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of us that owe a debt to Jim Gunn. Um, and I do also recommend Anne, Fink, Anne Finkbeiner's book. It's excellent. So if anyone out there wants some easy reading about large sky surveys, read Anne Finkbeiner's book about the SDSS. It, it really, it gets to a couple of points, but it shows you that a lot of the, you know, the majesty of these surveys can be reduced down to very, very careful um, decisions made on a daily basis and a lot of unexpected things cropping up. It, it never runs smoothly. And also that there's dozens and dozens of people involved in, in these efforts. So um, any credit is not due to me and anything I show you today, I will neglect to mention the dozens of people that I should be um, thanking, um, because one of the things I love most about working in large collaborations is this model of prestige, that there's one great mind out there doing all the work is not true at all. Um, it's always the contributions of many, many people. I think science probably was always like that. It just was never really historically reported as being like that. But um, certainly in these large collaborations, you get this impression that there are many, many people working towards a common goal, which is wonderful. And I feel it's like how science should be. Um, so lots of people deserve credit for lots of slides I will present in this talk. So let's start with a little bit of a background about what we want to understand in the universe and how we're going to understand it. Um, we can go all the way back to general relativity. I will mention Einstein. There were other contributors like Robertson and Lamartre and Walker and many, many people. Um, but Einstein, I think, is the most well-known of the people that contributed general relativity towards uh, our understanding of the universe. And there are two things you really need to know, and I'll give you a sort of a, as brief an overview as I can while still giving you some information. One is, what is the main thing we're trying to do from the observational side? These giant telescopes behind me in this beautiful photograph, which also I didn't take, somebody else in the DESI collaboration took, credit for everyone else. Um, but also, theoretically, what are we trying to understand about the universe? So let's start with that. The main problem we have as cosmologists, as people who want to understand the wider universe, is distances are difficult to measure. Now, you can go back to the ancient Greeks, stories of Eratosthenes measuring the circumference of the Earth. Um, and back then, even then, they probably thought, well, one day, if, if we're right that the Earth is indeed round, and if we're right that it's around about 20, 5,000 or so stadia all the way around, we'll know that someday because it's not inconceivable that a human being could just walk or sail that distance. When you're talking about the universe, that's completely inconceivable. Traveling even to the nearest stars would take millions, if not billions of years. Certainly traveling to the nearest galaxies would take millions of billions of, or billions of years. So Unless technology takes an incredible leap, 
in which case all of our cosmological world model will break down anyway, um, we're never going to be able to walk there. So we need, or travel there. So we need tricks to measure distances. And at some point, um, you should uh, get, get somebody to talk to you about gravitational waves. There's a nice trick that relies on something called cosmic sirens. But I will stick to discussing the two classical ways we measure distances in cosmology. Um, one is using uh, the size of objects, and one is using light from objects. So stare at this town and try and gauge the distance to this town. Um, and think things like, do you think it's a small town or, or is it a big city? Um, the, the collection of lights, do they look like the downtown area is huge or small? Are they bright? Do they look like you know, individual skyscrapers? Do they look like people's houses? Um, if you wanna try and guess, uh, if you were trying to guess, this is a, a photo of, of Tokyo from the air. I think it's upside down. Um, so north is south and south is north. And if you were thinking about gauging distance, I hope that certain things popped in your head. One thing is maybe you um, were focusing on the lights and saying things like, well, if those are, if those are street lights um, hmm, and they're that bright uh, and I'm seeing them, they appear this bright, how far away are they? Another thing I maybe you did is you sort of looked at the road system or the, the little bay above the city and thought, how big is that typically? And it appears this big on the image. Um, therefore, it must be this far away. So those are how bright something is and how big something appears, how bright something appears and how big something appears, are the classical measures in um, cosmology of distances. How bright something appears is called a standard candle test. So again, in this image, classic question, which is brighter, the full moon or the street light? Well, you're probably thinking it depends on what you mean by brighter. They appear to be about the same brightness in the image, but you know the full moon is much further away. So what you're seeing here, the full moon is very bright, but because it's farther away, it appears the same brightness to your eye as the street light, which is very nearby. So another way of thinking about that is, I know the street lamp, I know how bright it is. I mean, I don't in this particular street lamp, but say it's 60 watts. I could measure the distance to it, knowing how much energy it was putting off. I know, we happen to know how bright the full moon is. So I could also use its brightness to measure the distance to it. So if you can find an object in the sky in the wider universe, that you know how bright it truly intrinsically is. That's a standard candle. If you can then measure how bright it appears, knowing how bright it truly is, knowing how bright it appears from Earth, you can derive the distance. Standard candle measure of distance. Another way to think about this is how big something appears. So look at this person running away from you. If I told you this was the, the tallest person on earth, they were, you know, two and a half meters tall, really tall indeed, um, you'd say, okay, well, I know how big they appear in the image. I know how big they truly are. I can gauge the distance. If I said to you, actually, this is, this is uh, somebody tiny, they're barely a meter tall, it, it's a child, you'd think they're much closer because if they're smaller, they must be closer to your eye to appear this size compared to something really big. This is called a standard ruler test. If you know how big something truly is and you can measure how big it appears, then you have a measure of the distance to that object. So two classical ways to measure distance. And measuring distance, it's not the only thing in cosmology, but it's hugely important. Um, two classical ways to do it. Standard candle, how bright something truly is, measure how bright it appears, got the distance. Standard ruler, how big something truly intrinsically is, measure how big it appears, you can derive the distance. Now I'm conveniently glossing over um, the statements how big something truly is and how bright something truly intrinsically is. 
These are the difficult parts to distance measurements when you're trying to measure these huge distances you can't travel in the universe. You need to find either something that you know how bright it really is or something that you know how big it really truly is. You need a standard candle or a standard ruler. So that's sort of mostly what we need to be able to measure. There is one other quantity. You've heard of it. You may already know about it. It's called the redshift. And let me try and describe at least with a, a sort of quick overview what a redshift is. So I'm showing you a classic, Einstein loved this, um, toy model of our universe. Our universe we think starts small, here it is on the left, and it expands to be much bigger, here it is on the right. So think about what happens to photons, particles of light in our universe as it expands. I have a, a short wavelength, which corresponds to blue light. And as the universe expands, the space stretches and the photons of light all stretch as well. And their wavelength gets longer as space time stretches and they become red. So if a photon of light, the yellow blobs here, it's quite an old image, um, are galaxies. If the photons of light leave a galaxy a long time ago, and then over time, the universe expands and stretches the light, then by the time the light comes from a galaxy to us on Earth, it's been stretched, well, our galaxy, and it appears redder. The more time it's had to travel, the more the universe will have expanded, the more the light will have stretched. And so light takes time to travel. More distant galaxies, the light has had more time to travel, the light will appear to be stretched more. So consequently, there is some relationship that says the farther away you are, farther away a galaxy is, the more time it's had for the light to stretch and the more red shifted the longer wavelength the light from that galaxy will appear. There is another consequence of this. Blue white hot is much hotter than red hot. And so blue light is hotter than red light. So in the image over here on the left, the small universe blue light, hot light, as the universe expands and becomes bigger, the light gets redder and redder, but it also gets cooler and cooler. So two consequences of the universe getting bigger, light from distant objects, more distant objects is more shifted to the red in wavelength, appears redder to your eye. And over time, the universe in general gets cooler and cooler and cooler as it expands. So this is what redshift really looks like. We take a spectrum of an object, um, as Ritterband pointed out, quasars happen to be my favorite objects. So this is a, a spectrum of a quasar. It's a luminous black hole. The material around the, the center of the heart of a distant galaxy, the material around it is moving very rapidly. It's very hot. And so if you take atomic species and you move them around some object, so they're coming towards and away from you, towards and away from you, you get a Doppler shift. When they're coming towards you, and away from you, the light is shifted to the blue and the red, and any signature of that atomic species is going to be broadened. And so these nice broad lines in this spectrum um, tell you rapidly orbiting material. The fact this spectrum is sort of has more light coming out at the blue end, blue is hot, so it tells you this is a hot object. There are plenty of people who study quasars and the physics of the um, material around the black holes in depth. I used to do a little bit of that. I don't really anymore. All I care about is these are superlatively good objects for measuring redshift because they're very bright. You can see them over very long distances. So what does a redshift look like? Look at the bluest spectrum here. We, we take some spectrum, we have some spectrograph. All we're really doing is splitting the light from an object out into all its constituent colors, ultraviolet at a wavelength of about 2000 angstroms through red almost bordering on the infrared, 
over here at seven to 8,000 angstroms. The spectrum is all the light that comes out in the different specific wavelengths, the different colors. So look at this blue quasar. We know, for instance, that in a lab on Earth, the first big broad emission line you're seeing corresponds to the Lyman alpha transition of hydrogen, which would be at 12, 15 angstroms. But that's been shifted towards almost 2,000 angstroms. And as you place a quasar more and more distant, this very distinct feature gets shifted further and further to the red. So the one on the left, the one that, oops, sorry, the one that the peaky, big, obvious feature is near 2,000 angstroms is close to us. And the one over on the right that looks redder has been shifted to be much, corresponding to being much, much further away from us. So what have we got? Well, we can measure distances if we can use these standard candle and standard ruler tricks, and we can measure redshifts. This is the easy part, if you can take a spectrum of an object. And if you can do that, Einstein tells us, and lots of other people, but general relativity, from it you can derive simple relationships that link distances, one of these tricks, to redshifts. And what you're looking at here in this equation, don't worry about how it was derived. Um, at some point in your career, I hope you will derive this sort of thing if you haven't already. But the thing in the blue box is a measure of distance. And the thing in the red box is a measure of redshift. And that probably makes sense to you. There's some relationship. Um, in this expanding universe model, if a galaxy is farther away from you, the light took more time to get to you, the light was stretched more, and therefore the object uh, appears redder, longer wavelength. So if you know how the universe is moving and expanding and changing its size, then you're gonna be able to derive a relationship between distance and redshift in some complicated, more complicated universe than I'm displaying, but here's that relationship between distance and redshift. DC for distance, Z for redshift. The things that control the relationship between distance and redshift are how much stuff there is in the universe. So this is a measure of the total mass in the universe. If there's a lot of stuff, if there's a lot of mass, there's a lot of gravity. Gravity pulls on things. It tries to stop the universe expanding, changing the rate of expansion, changing the relationship between distance and redshift. You get to measure the shape of the universe. Um, we happen to think this term is very close to zero, but you can imagine I showed you a couple of spheres, a small sphere and a big sphere for the universe expanding. If it wasn't that shape, if the light was traversing different total distances, at different total universal expansions, the relationship between the distance and how much the light got stretched over time before it got to you would change. So geometry factors in. And so the final thing is this thing. This is often called the cosmological constant. And um, you, you will hear it referred to uh, in terms as well, uh, like dark energy, dark energy is uh, the cosmological constant is a specific form of dark energy. We'll talk about that a little more. Um, this term is, uh, has a story behind it where basically when Einstein and others derived these relationships, they realized that the universe, the implication from general relativity is that the universe was expanding, but we didn't know it was. The observations, the measurements suggested the universe was, was static, it was still. And it wasn't until um, Hubble and Humerson came along and demonstrated, measured these redshifts and distances and demonstrated that the universe was expanding, that we knew it was expanding. Before then, Einstein said, oh, this is a problem. My premier theory that everyone loves, general relativity, predicts an expanding universe, but the universe doesn't expand. So I need something to turn it off. So he added this fudge factor, this cosmological constant to 
counteract the effects of gravity and geometry to turn off the expansion of the universe. So with just the right value of this cosmological constant, you could hold the universe still. And Einstein wasn't too happy about this because it's clearly you know, a fudge, but he said, this is one way general relativity could predict a static universe. So we need this weird term. Later on in the 1920s, when Hubble and Humerson discovered the universe was expanding, Einstein said, oops, a uh, big blunder. He called it the biggest blunder of his career. My mistake. I retract it. We don't need this term at all. Great. This is zero. Just forget about it because the universe does indeed expand. But the game here, I'll, I'll, not everything in cosmology, but a huge amount in classical cosmology is if you can measure distances and relate them to redshifts, you get to learn. Um, you get to learn about how much stuff there is in the universe the geometry of the universe, the shape of the universe, and maybe if there's something weird going on with the expansion. And, of course, there is something weird going on with the expansion. So back in the 90s, people started to use, using cameras sort of similar to the SDSS that Ritterband was talking about and also um, computational capability to reduce images from those cameras really quickly. So you've got a nice picture very quickly and compared lots of images of the same parts of the sky computationally. People were, went looking for supernovae. So I don't want to say too much about supernovae, exploding, imploding, stars, long way away, um, very, very bright. When a star collapses, the energy that's put out is immense. Particular types of supernovae, we think all collapse at a very similar mass. And, you know, to be brief, because E equals MC squared, mass corresponds to energy. So if everything collapses at a specific mass, then it releases the same energy. So it appears the same brightness. It's, well, it doesn't appear to us the same brightness, but it's one of these objects that we think we know how bright it should be. So if you find a bunch of these and measure how bright they appear, standard candle, we think we know how bright it is, we measure how bright it appears, we can derive the distance. And so Perlmutter, Saul Perlmutter and Brian Schmidt, Madame Reese won a Nobel Prize for looking at lots of these and discovering something strange. What they discovered was the universe seemed to track nicely with our, uh, the model I put up before without the cosmological constant, meaning, that you go back some interval in time and things would appear to be a bit further away, which is great. But then you got to a specific distance and instead of sort of this relationship, suddenly this happened. Fall over things that I do that too quickly, but at a certain distance in the universe corresponding to a certain time the light had taken to get to you, everything was suddenly further away. So we're doing this and then whoosh, so one interpretation of that is if everything is suddenly further away, the expansion of the universe must have accelerated. It must have suddenly got faster. So this is called, I like calling this cosmic acceleration. Observationally, I think that makes a lot of sense. Suddenly all of, the uh, all of these supernovae appear dimmer. They appear like uh, something has made them dimmer all of a sudden. One way to interpret that is they're further away. Uh, so Einstein's biggest blunder was back. Uh, we now needed the speed of the universe to change. And the way you do it, just like Einstein did it when he tried to stop the universe expanding, is you put in this term that suddenly makes the universe expand faster, this cosmic acceleration. Supernovae observations tell you that this is happening. Cosmic acceleration, sometimes also called dark energy um, from a theoretical perspective. Mostly, I like to think of it as an acceleration, but there you go. So let's think about this in some detail. I've already told you that everything suddenly appeared dimmer. And one interpretation is the universe accelerated and everything shifted farther away from us. 
There are other ways to make things suddenly appear dimmer. One possibility, perhaps these supernovae aren't standard candles. I said they all implode, explode at the same energy, which are same corresponding to a specific mass. Maybe that's not true. When you look further away in the universe, you're looking back in time. What if the nature of stars changes as you look back in time? The nature of the ones that are collapsing changes as you look back in time. Maybe supernovae are different as you look at different distances, and so they're not a standard candle. That's one interpretation. And so the change in brightness, that everything suddenly looks dimmer, isn't that they're farther away, isn't that the universe is accelerating, it's that supernovae are weird. One possibility. Another possibility where you could suddenly make things dimmer. What if you get to a certain distance in the universe and there's a curtain of dust, there's a shroud of dust blocking the light from the supernovae. And so perhaps you go back in through the universe and there's a little bit of dust. And as you go further back, there's more of it. And it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And at a certain time in the history of the universe, there's just a lot of it. And it blocks the light from distant supernovae. And so all of a sudden, at a certain distance, they appear dimmer because the light's blocked. You need a very special kind of dust to do this. We know that um, dust, if you've ever looked at um, the air uh, around, say, sunset or sunrise near a forest fire, the, the light doesn't vanish completely. It just goes red. And so this would have to be special dust that didn't just make the light redder. Um, but it's a possibility. Block the light from the supernovae with some sort of gray dust, and they become dimmer. So three possibilities. This cosmic acceleration is happening. The supernovae will suddenly get further away. You need Einstein's cosmological constant or some other form of dark energy. Two, um, supernovae are special and weird as you go further away in the universe. Three, there's some dust in the universe. How would you resolve those three possibilities and check that the supernovae were right? Well, Remember our standard ruler test. If you know how big something appears, you can see as I do this, you know, I'm, I'm bigger when I'm closer, I'm smaller because I'm further away. If you know how big something truly is, sorry, you measure how big it appears, you can also derive the distance. This would be a really useful check because if supernovae are weird, if they change as you go back in, time in the universe to larger distances. If you can find something that's based on something other than supernovae, some ruler-based test, that gets rid of that problem. That's a great check that supernovae aren't just strange. Also think about the shroud of weird dust as a possibility. Well, if I do this, I can make things dimmer. I can block the light from them. But when I do this, when I cover my face, you know, I'm blocking parts of my face, but it's not getting smaller. It's not getting bigger. It's not changing in size. So if I put dust in front of these supernovae, I can change how bright they appear, but I'm not gonna change how big something appears by putting dust in front of it. So finding something other than a standard candle test with supernovae, say a standard ruler test, is a really good way of checking because you get rid of this gray dust possibility, you get rid of the possibility the supernovae are weird, and all that would be left would be the universe is accelerating things away from us, and that's why they appear dimmer. Or, in the case of a standard ruler, they would all suddenly appear smaller. They'd be thrown away from us, they'd get smaller. So the problem here is finding something that you know how big it truly is, standard ruler, because if you can measure how big it appears, then you can measure its distance. So a bit more background in cosmology for you. Here's a nice simulation of the universe from Volker Springle's group. So as the universe moves on in time, gravity collects galaxies together. It's quite hypnotic to watch. So eventually stuff collects together. 
You get large clusters of galaxies, of stuff. You get large voids where the material has been drawn away to form gaps. One more time, because it's so, so hypnotic to watch it. So early on, you start with the universe with everything randomly distributed in terms of density fluctuations. You press go, gravity collects things together where there's a bit more stuff and pulls things away from where there's a bit less stuff. And over almost 14 billion years, you get these nice structures, these clusters of galaxies and these empty pockets, these voids. So if you're characterizing how much things are clustered in the universe, well, how would you do it? You need a nice statistic. So let me take this plot, this, this, this sorry, this movie, this beautiful movie created by Volker Springles Group, and turn it into sort of a, a toy image of how the galaxies are distributed in our universe. So something like this. So in this square on the right, uh, I know because I made it, there are an equal number of red points and black points. But I, in some ad hoc way, I've made the black points cluster together and the red points are distributed completely at random. So think about statistically characterizing this. Let's put down a blue circle. The bottom right one is quite a good one to look at. I think it's really illustrative. If you look at the blue circle of a certain size, count the number of black points in it. There's a lot. Count the number of red points in it. There's not so many. So by counting the number of galaxies versus a random distribution of stuff, of galaxies, if there's a lot of black points in your circle and not so many red points, you're clustered. That would be near a cluster of galaxies. If you move out to the larger blue circle and think about it carefully, you might be able to convince yourself that we pick up quite a lot of red points and there aren't that many black points added. So in the larger blue circle, there's still more black points, but there's less of an excess of black points compared to red points. So if I just make circles of different sizes, count the number of black points, count the number of red points, divide one by the other, I have a measure of how clustered you are in that circle. If I drew a circle or an area that was the size of the entire square, I promise you there's an equal number of black points and red points. And so the number of black points divided by the number of red points would be exactly one. No clustering. It looks just like a random distribution in a box that's that big. We tend to subtract minus, we take one off. We tend to say, okay, number of black points divided by number of red points is equal. One, uh, you get one. Subtract one, you get zero. Zero means no clustering. So that's a choice, but we tend to do it. Um, and so what I'm getting at is make circles of different sizes, count the total number of black points, the total number of red points, subtract one, and you have some measure for how clustered the universe is. Think about what this would look like on a plot. So on the x-axis, I have my circle size. And on the y-axis, I have the number of black points divided by the number of red points minus one. When the circle size is small, lots of black points, huge excess, so the plot would be up here somewhere. When the circle size is big, or the box, the whole box, I drop down to close to zero. Small circles, big excess, large circles, small excess. So the plot would look something like this. Small circles, if you like, close together galaxies, large excess. Big circles over at the far end of the x-axis, more like random, so close to zero. Now, in my previous slide, I just showed you everything is circles on the sky. I'm looking up, I have some angle on the sky. I don't know how that angle really corresponds to a physical size because I don't really know the distance to the galaxies. It's what I'm trying to work out in this problem. And so 
I've left off any measure of the true physical size on the x-axis of this plot. It's just angles in the sky for now. What we want, again, standard ruler, if we knew how big one of these angles on the sky was physically, I could put a more physical unit on the x-axis. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back to the very, very early universe. If you remember, I told you when the universe is small, the photons of light are all squished together. They're blue, they're hot. As it expands, they get red shifted, they get redder, the universe cools off. Very early in the universe, the universe is so hot, there's so much energy that hydrogen doesn't even exist. It is always hot enough, there's always enough energy to rip apart hydrogen into its constituent protons and electrons. And so we have blue light here, hot light, ripping apart hydrogen to make protons and electrons. As the universe expands and it cools, the energy of the light, the photons changes, they stretch, and eventually they don't have enough energy to ionize hydrogen, to rip it apart. And what is left is neutral hydrogen atoms and cooler light. This is often called recombination. At this, um, when the universe is hot, you sort of have a plasma of matter and stuff and also really hot light, just it's, the universe is really opaque. Uh, the light can't escape because it keeps bouncing off hydrogen. It, it's a bit like the interior of a star. You can't just glare into it and see into it because the light can't get out. Um, but once the universe expands and the light cools, it's no longer trapped bouncing off the hydrogen, it can stream out into the universe. So the light that um, streams out and the universe suddenly becomes transparent, you can see some light, is, uh, is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And at this point, you end up with matter and radiation. Before that, matter and radiation are all coupled together. Picture again when they're all coupled together. So this plasma-like thing. And this isn't a perfect analogy, but I want you to picture this plasma like the top of a bucket of water. It's a beautiful still layer on the top of a bucket of water. But the water isn't still, the bucket isn't still. We know the universe is expanding. So imagine you take the sides of that bucket of water and you pull them out. These Expand them smoothly, say, a little bit. What's going to happen to the top layer of water? You're going to get ripples forming as the bucket is pulled out. And the, um, the physics of that is, is reasonably simple to describe. But if the bucket was expanding smoothly, you would know the ripples that formed on the surface layer in the bucket. And so in our plasma, which is it's not a liquid phase, but close enough analogy. As the universe is expanding, these ripples form in the plasma, like on the surface of the water. These are sound waves propagating, not in a, on a two-dimensional bucket top, but in three dimensions. Because they're sound waves, they get called acoustic oscillations. Um, once the matter is decoupled, I've been illustrating this with hydrogen, but really it's the underlying dark matter as well. Once these decouple, it's not like a watery bucket state anymore. It's not a plasma. And those sound waves stop propagating. They, if you will, turn off. So in the plasma, you have these acoustic ripples, these oscillations. And once the universe expands to the other state, they're frozen in place. The universe is very small at this point, so the ripples are tiny, but over the next 14 billion years or so, the universe is going to expand and the ripples are going to be stretched to appear on very, very large scales. They're subtle. You think about what a ripple means. It means that um, we have a bit more stuff and a bit less stuff. So where the sound wave was propagating, I should do this for a sound wave, but where the sound wave was propagating 
and there was a bit more stuff, that's frozen in to the distribution of matter in the universe. And where there's a bit less stuff, that's frozen in too. So if you could look on very large scales because the universe has expanded so much, you should be able to find these remnant ripples, these leftover acoustic oscillation echoes from the very early universe just before this decoupling happened. Uh, one other point on this is this slight excess and slight um, lack uh, don't just get frozen into the matter, into the stuff, they're frozen into the light as well, the cosmic microwave background radiation that comes streaming out. So I won't talk about it more, but if you've ever looked at a plot of the distribution of the light, like measuring it sort of like this, distribution of the light, how much stuff there is, excess, a little bit less, for the cosmic microwave background radiation, you see bumps, you see ripples these frozen in sound waves. So we have a ripple. We have a slight, a tiny excess of stuff on very large scales. And if you go out in the universe and you can measure the distribution of excess galaxies over just random points, you see on large scales, there's a little bit of a blip. There actually should be multiple blips. The, the physics of sound is pretty simple in the early universe. You can also look at the light, the cosmic microwave background radiation to see where the ripples should be. But you should get more than one ripple. It's just larger scales than this. So out beyond 100, um, there's a lot of stuff in the early universe and a lot of it causes little ripples. And so um, there's much, the next generation of surveys will look out there, but there's a lot going on. On smaller scales, Gravity has had an opportunity to collect some of the galaxies back together. And this ripple is much, much less of an excess than the excess from the force of gravity over billions of years pulling things together. So left of 100 on this plot, galaxy is, uh, galaxy, gravity has basically washed out any ripples. But let's focus on this ripple. We know from the physics of sound, we know it looking in the cosmic micro background radiation, that it's about 100 and a little bit more megaparsecs per H. That's a weird unit. Think of it as a ripple that is about a half a billion light years long. Corresponds to roughly, if you're looking up at the sky and thinking of angles, roughly two degrees. But most importantly, it's there. And so it's our standard ruler. Ritterband gave a wonderful introduction about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And in some of its later iterations, they went looking for this ripple. And here it is. This is real data taken from other people's papers. I've, I've been bad and I haven't actually put the papers down, uh, the, the names of the, 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 the authors. But if you go looking for Varian Acoustic Oscillation Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you will find the measurement from the early Sloan um, with 50,000 galaxies and the measurement from the third iteration of the Sloan, and you'll actually find it from the fourth iteration of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey now, slightly more distant, so the light stretch, slightly higher redshift. This was Z.35, this is Z.57, and there is your beautiful ripple corresponding to 100 and a bit megaparsecs per H, or about a half a billion light years. So now, think about what we were doing with the supernovae. We knew how bright something appeared, a standard candle, how bright it truly was, sorry. We measured how bright it appeared, we got a distance. Here we have a new way of relating distance to redshift. We, have, we measure for a sample of galaxies at a certain redshift, the clustering. We make one of these structure plots. We find where the ripple is, and we know the angle of that ripple corresponds, the angular size on the sky on average over lots of galaxies corresponds to a physical scale. So if our model of the universe is wrong, this physical scale is shifted left or right, but we have a way of relati relating redshift of our sample of galaxies to distance, and we can get the true distance using this 
standard ruler, this Bering acoustic oscillation feature. And so we've done this now. I've shown you two, two plots. There are many more because um, uh, all of this work is sort of a decade ago at this point, a bit more for the first STSS measurement. So how did the supernovae do? I told you the supernovae measured a certain acceleration in the universe, but what if the supernovae are weird? What if it's a special kind of dust? Well, perhaps to your excitement or perhaps to your disappointment, the Bering acoustic oscillation measurements agree with the supernovae exactly. So good news, it is not gray dust. It's not that supernovae are special, it's genuinely that the cosmos started to accelerate of order 5 billion or so years ago. And so this cosmic acceleration is real. This dark energy is real. Maybe it's the cosmological constant in this equation. It seems to be at the moment. So there is, why this is exciting, I mean, this is a, you know, it would have been lovely to solve the supernova problem. But why this is exciting is um, we don't really know what this is. That's why I like to call it cosmic acceleration, because we can measure it's there with multiple different methods that confirm each other, independent methods. We know it's real. There's a real expansionary extra push in the universe caused by some underlying physics, but we don't know what that is at all. Now, there are models out there that people have proposed, but we don't really know what this dark energy is. To give you an overview of the sorts of measurements with Bering acoustic oscillations, and by the way, in this plot, the supernovae measurements would get out to roughly a redshift of one as well. Here is a slightly out of date, admittedly, plot of lots of different Bering acoustic oscillations, so standard ruler clustering measurements um, com uh, that compare redshift to distance. And one on the y-axis of this plot corresponds to this, this nice, simple cosmological constant model I've been showing you. And so you can see everything lines up pretty well. But what I want you to focus on in this plot is, um, and again, you, you can go look at similar. And this one is a very pretty one, which I think is very illustrative. You can go look at similar plots for the final STSS four results, what's called EBOS. Um, and this reduces the error bars a little bit. But look at this, and I hope you can see that, well, the, the error bars are fairly large, um, you know, five to 10 percent ish. There's some gap, there's some real estate between about a redshift of one and a redshift of two, where, where you see EBOS quasars, STSS DR14. So we haven't constrained it that well at that point in the history of the universe, remember? Further distances, more time for the photons to travel, more red shift. So larger red shifts correspond to larger distances and earlier times. So at these distances, at these earliest times, not a great measurement. We don't really understand what dark energy is, but what you'd, you'd like to do is fill in this sort of plot so that there are no gaps, so that the error bars are tiny, because imagine um, if the universe, you know, we think it, it was gravity was winning, the universe was decelerating because all the stuff in it was stopping it from expanding. Then all of a sudden, cosmic acceleration kicked in at a redshift of 0.7 to 0.8 ish. Imagine there's more information. There's a little wiggle in acceleration versus deceleration. The universe started to accelerate and then decelerated and then accelerated. There might be more information hidden in the gaps or hidden in the error bars of this plot, where you could go and derive unexpected information, just like the supernovae, that might help us understand what dark energy is. So what you'd love is a survey that covered all of these redshifts with really tiny error bars. And that brings me to the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. How do you fill in you know, that entire real estate with tiny error bars? Well, to get tiny error bars, you need lots and lots and lots of spectra. If you remember, some of the plots I was showing you earlier were based on 
about a million spectra, probably a few million at this point. Um, you would like to be able to probe lots of different distances. Nearby, you can use galaxies. They're pretty bright. Uh, they appear pretty bright when they're nearby. Further away, as Ritterban pointed out, you want bright stuff like quasars to help you probe the more distant universe. And so you'd like to do a range of different things in the sky, and you would like to do lots and lots of them. The SDSS took, towards the end of the SDSS, um, where, where I showed you the, the final results from it, or the later results from it, it was taking about a thousand spectra simultaneously. If you could take 5,000 spectra simultaneously, dedicated, use a really big telescope so that you can see the most distant objects and collect more light from them. And if you could take 5,000 spectra continually over say approximately about five years, you could grow from a few million galaxies and quasars to more like 30 to 35 million galaxies and quasars fill in all those gaps, make the error bars much smaller, and that would be a fantastic thing to do. And in fact, be a great constraint on dark energy. You could design a survey which nearby, where I've put, an also, put also a bright galaxy survey, just looked at typical galaxies. You've seen them, little spiral arms or elliptical galaxies. And then you, further out, you try to find more luminous galaxies called luminous red galaxies. In each of these plots, I'm going to show you a spectrum of what that sort of object looks like. And I'm going to show you a constraint. And I know the units on the y-axis is a little scary, but just think of it in terms of these constraints, a constraint that such a sample could give you. So if you could find luminous red galaxies, if you could find galaxies that had bright emission lines. So if you look in the spectrum, you see these nice spiky emission lines. So you find these emission line galaxies, they get you out a little bit further because they're a little bit brighter. If you could find quasars, there they are, quasi stellar objects, QSOs, you can go out a little bit further again because they're a bit brighter. And here's, I showed you one earlier, here's an example spectrum of a quasar. And finally, as the quasar shifts a long way to the red, because you're at larger distances, you start to see bluewards of the Lyman alpha transition of hydrogen, the light from the quasar shining through everything in front of it in the universe. And it picks out lots and lots of clouds of hydrogen gas. And you can do the clustering measurement on that hydrogen gas as well, derive the Baryon acoustic oscillation. And um, a low, these are much dimmer. There's many, 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 many clouds of hydrogen gas per quasar, so it improves your statistics. Um, and so you can use more distant quasars to put these points on the plot. And so ultimately, you can do this survey that spans, fills the entire real estate I was talking about before, spans large, uh, a large range of redshift, so a large range of distances and times, has much smaller error bars than previous work. And the hope is that in doing this, you learn more about cosmic acceleration and pin down these models of dark energy. As I said, to do this, you need a bigger telescope than Sloan used. Um, you need a nice big focal plane, what you're staring at the sky with. And you'd like to be able to take 5,000 spectra simultaneously and keep doing this you know, every, every 15, 20 minutes or so, keep doing this for a five-year period. So technologically, this requires quite a bit of work. So let's show you how to do this. What you're looking at in the top left here is you're looking at, um, simultan you're looking at how the Sloan Digital Sky Survey got spectra. They put optical fibers into plates that went in the telescope's focal plane. They put a thousand per observation and a human being placed, very talented human beings, see the hands, placed the optical fibers in each of the holes. And then that plate would go to the telescope and you could simultaneously take a thousand spectra. One of the major advances with DESI is 
this takes a long time for humans to do this. We're going to instead use robots. And in the bottom left, you're seeing a robot that twists and turns and moves around and places an optical fiber in a particular location. So DESI has these wedges that has 500 hole, have 500 holes for each of these robots to sit in, it has 10 wedges, and the robots can place optical fibers, point them at very specific locations on the sky, and take spectra. So you can get 5,000 spectra, and you don't need to wait for a human to finish. You can do this in real time. When you finish an observation, the robots can move. It takes them a few minutes. Reconfigure your focal plane, and you can take new spectra, whatever's optimal that's in the sky at that particular time. So that's a huge technological advance. Um, I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to show you, you need better images of the sky to be able to do this. We have a complementary survey for DESI called the DESI Legacy Surveys Imaging. Um, it makes beautiful images. This is from a viewer you can go online and look at yourself. If you're interested, look up DESI Legacy Surveys Imaging, and you can scroll around the sky and look at all the pretty things. Um, We've got a lot of coverage. We cover a lot of area. So we're able to target a lot of things for follow-up spectroscopy. Our images are better than SDSS. I hope you agree the image on the right is sharper. There are more things in it than the image on the left. So we can go deeper. We can get more information about the objects we're targeting. And then basically the trick is you find your objects. For instance, the galaxies are Pretty easy to find. They're the biggest things. Um, you know, it's more sophisticated than that. There were also some galaxies in here your eye wouldn't pick out immediately. The quasars are the blue hot things. Unfortunately, lots of stars are blue and hot as well. But we can pick them out in imaging. There's one, for instance. So I'm going to skip my next couple of slides because I went a little over um, and show you how we would have selected those things. But that's the goal. So we have this four meter telescope, the, the male Kit Peak four meter telescope. On it, it has in this large focal plane, it has this device which can place 5,000 optical fibers on things in the sky simultaneously. Over the next five years, this survey started earlier this year in May, I think it was May. Over the next five years, we're gonna take um, spectra of tens of millions of galaxies and quasars by measuring, making the clustering measurements and detecting the baryon acoustic oscillation peak, we will be able to build the distance redshift relation throughout the entire history of the universe um, with a view to it, hopefully telling us something about what this strange exotic cosmic acceleration or dark energy is. Um, thank you. And if we have time, I'll take questions. Thank you, Adam. Um, it was a wonderful talk. Some of the slides, I, I wish I could uh, steal some of the slides. <laughs> you're, welcome to have, you're welcome to have them. Many of them are not my work. Um, they were okay. for many, many people, so. Um, okay. So um, I'll now uh, go to the questions and I'll start with the, I mean, there are several questions and I'll start with the ones that are more aligned to the talk. So, um, for example, Deepon Bethal asked that, can there be, uh, well, I mean, uh, can there be red shifts and Doppler effect in gravitational wave as well? So that, that is, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but one of the very fascinating things about gravitational waves is that the red shift effect cancels so if you see a gravitational wave, it is stretched in a particular way that, and one, the, the way to think about it is, this can be a long, longer description, but you're usually seeing gravitational waves from orbiting objects. And what creates the waves is as they orbit, they're doing it at a certain time. So quick, lots of dips in space, further away, slower. So there is a time component to gravitational waves as objects orbit together and fall into each other depends on time. 
And as I described to you, distances depend on redshift. Time depends on redshift too. And it turns out that that time thing, as they orbit and fall in, has a dependence on redshift. How far they are away has a dependence on redshift and they cancel. So you can get a direct distance to a gravitational wave because the redshift effect in distance and time exactly cancel out. It's a beautiful thing. And it means that gravitational waves also can be used for cosmological measurements, except they don't need to worry about the distance redshift relation. They get exact direct distances. So if you want to calibrate the distance redshift relation, you have to then go find the galaxy that the gravitational wave was in make the measurement of distance that way to get the redshift, you have a direct distance from the gravitational wave and you can calibrate your distance redshift relation. But it, it is a sort of a magical property of gravitational waves. They're gonna put the rest of us cosmologists out of business eventually, that you can get a direct distance because the redshift effects cancel exactly. Okay, um, Shogato Borat has raised his hand. Uh, Shogato, could you unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, hello, Adam. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question might be a little naive because I really do not know a lot about this field. Uh, in one of your last slides, you showed a real picture of the sky and you said that... Um, it could really be contaminated by a lot of stars uh, in the field. Uh, and you said that, but we, by looking at that image, we can identify the quasars. I was wondering, like, without looking at the spectrum, uh, is it possible to distinguish the quasar from a star? It's great. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and it was the last two or three slides of my talk, but I was running out of time. So thank you for that. Um, so to your eye, if you look on the right hand, it's, it's very illustrative. I think everything or pretty much everything in that image where it says find the quasar is a star. So we're looking out through our galaxy through all these stars to the background objects out in the wider universe. So we're looking through often through stars in the foreground and we wanna find the quasars in the background. By eye, it's difficult. They're all blue compact points of light. Oops. Sorry, try and go back, keeps doing that. So that one is a quasar, I promise you. Now, again, by eye, tough. But what we can really do is I'm showing you one particular color image of this sky. We have a blue one, we have a green one, we have a red one, we have an infrared one. And so there are subtle differences in color between qu most quasars and most stars. And so I could make a plot like this one where Instead of considering just blue light, I look at here, I'm looking at ultraviolet light, blue light, blue light and red light and comparing them. And by plotting very specific colors, you see that most quasars are slightly bluer than most stars. And so what you have to do is you have to scan through these images. This is a very small patch of the sky. You have to, for millions and millions and billions of objects extract their exact colors. You make a plot like this, and then this is a little too clean. You can say most of the quasars have colors here. Most of the stars have colors here. If my computer can just pick out the exact colors of the quasars, then those are the ones we can go away and observe. But the other reason your question is superb is because we're not perfect. Um, something like half the time, we're gonna find that in this overlapping region where the quasars are close to the stars in colors, we're gonna find, we thought it was a quasar, it was actually a, a star. So about half the time we get a contaminant. So the game is you use the images which are easy to observe to work out the colors of all the things you think might be quasars. And then one thing the spectrum gives you uh, is a confirmation that that's truly an extra extragalactic quasar and not a nearby star. Um, but part of the reason you need to take lots of spectra is, at least for the quasars, uh, of order 50, 60% of the time you're right. And depending on the exact redshift, sometimes you're wrong as well. 
Okay. Um, so now uh, there are two questions which are sort of related. So I'll I'll just ask them together. Anilesh Datto has asked, um, is there any limitation of the SDSS DR16? And Moitreya Kundu has asked, what new science does SDSS DR16 have to contribute to the BAO observations uh, compared to the previous data releases? So right. limitations so, and new things, yeah. Yeah, so the, the main thing in, in this plot if I'd, if I'd been brave enough to put down SDSS DR16, there isn't a plot this pretty, but the error bars are, I think, about 60% the size of this. So the, the main thing SDSS DR16 gave you was, it was many more quasars. It was about, not quite, something like 30% more quasars, not quite twice as many, I think. I'm trying to pull numbers out of my head here, so this could be slightly wrong. But um, the main thing it gives you is this error bar is smaller, for sure. Um, and so the main limitation of STSS is because it didn't have this better imaging and because it, can, it moves much more slowly than DESI, it's a numbers game. It can't collect enough objects quickly enough to be able to fill in the gaps in this plot and make the error bars smaller. So what DR16 added was smaller error bars, it, this roughly this location in distance, in redshift. Um, but DESI is going to make those error bars much, 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 much smaller. I should also point out, because SDSS has been so fantastic, that I'm focusing on a very specific measurement here, constraining dark energy. STSS, all the data it collects, and Desi's going to do the same, quasars, galaxies, even the stars that I said, we don't want those, those aren't quasars. All of that information, other people can take away and do science with. And there's hundreds and hundreds of possible science projects that are a side effect of, of this drive to collect lots and lots of spectra to be able to, um, to constrain dark energy. So uh, DR16 added added a bit more numbers, so slightly smaller error bar, but Desi will add way, way more numbers than that. Okay, thank you. I think you. I captured both questions there. <laughs> yes, I think I think so too. So now, um, okay, so getting to two uh, questions that were, okay, one question that was asked previously. So Dipayan Kole asked that, is dark matter also expanding? So, Again, I'm not a theoretician, so I'm not a huge expert on dark matter, but think of, think of dark matter like um, any other particle. So if you can picture hydrogen, um, picture something it, or a proton, picture like that proton. But the only properties, who can picture protons, I know, but the only properties um, we know of is it has a gravitational effect. So picture like a proton, but we can't measure the charge, we can't measure the size, we can't measure any other property. And we're trying desperately to find any other properties about that particle, but all we can really measure are its gravitational effects. People are striving to constrain other properties. So a low exotic, because it appears to just interact with gravity, all that really means is that it's very weak in interacting in other ways. It doesn't like electromagnetism. It's just, it's weak at doing anything except interacting gravitationally. Um, so just like, you know, the particles in our body, as, as the universe expands, um, other forces are stronger than the expansion of the universe and our bodies don't get ripped apart slowly. Um, Gravity is a pretty strong force. So uh, relative to whatever dark energy is. And so you can just picture these little dark matter particles. They're just sitting out there clumped together because they, they, they're interacting through gravity, but they're not being ripped apart. The gravity is keeping them close together. And picture them like any other particle. I know it's difficult to picture any particle but just one that doesn't really do anything except interact through gravity. Okay, thank you, Adam, because this also answers another question by Shourab Nata, who asked about the nature of dark matter. 
Um, so one more question uh, about the dark sector. Snehashish uh, Bhattacharya asks, dark energy is a hypothetical form of energy that exerts negative repulsive pressure behaving like the opposite of gravity. So is this right to call it anti-gravity? And can we say that dark energy is proportional to the force causing the rate of expansion of our universe to accelerate over time? So it, it does exhibit properties of negative pressure. Um, I think thinking of it as an energy as energy is sort of misleading. I don't really like the phrase dark energy. I would prefer dark negative pressure. I think that would be a better way of describing it. Um, is, is it really a, a force um, over, over time? It's not proportional to anything about the expansion of the universe. Over time, it's completely the same. It's this very, 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 very weak negative pressure that has permeated the universe for 13.8 or so billion years. But if you think about, maybe a good way of at least hinting at it, if you think about this plot and this figure, very early on the universe is hot and then it expands. Um, and as it expands, it cools and radiation and matter decouple. So early in the universe, it's just dominated by radiation. Everything looks like a plasma. It's a radiation era in the universe. The radiation is strong, it's doing everything. Over time, as the universe cools, the radiation drops off um, and it's not as important. Over time, then, we have all this stuff, dark matter, particles, whatever, collected together under gravity. And, and there's a lot of gravity and it's dominating everything. But as the universe expands, the density of that stuff goes down. The overall average gravity goes, goes down. And so the matter becomes less dominant. So early on, radiation, lots of it, dominant. Then matter, lots of it, dominant. But over time, those things drop off and become less important. The dark energy, which is this very, very weak, weak, weak negative pressure, it's just sitting there being weak and not doing much. And over time, the radiation becomes less dominant and the matter becomes less dominant. And at some point, they're so weak, the radiation and the, the matter effects, the gravity effects, that they drop below the dark energy effect. And it starts to therefore appear. So the reason we see it later on in the universe is it took some time for all the gravity of the matter and stuff as the universe expanded to have less of an effect. So it's not proportional to the expansion of the universe. What happens is as gravity and matter become less important, suddenly, where it always was at that just low level, at that same we think level throughout history, suddenly it pops up over the other things which have dropped off. And that's why it becomes a contributor. So it's not proportional to the expansion in any way. The expansion has made matter less important than this negative pressure. And I love the phrase negative pressure and, and keep using it. Um, so it's not proportional to the expansion. It's always been the same. Um, it's a negative pressure, yes. Uh, I forget what the third question is, but that might, the third part of that question was, but that I, might I be think the, you have, you have answered it already, yes. That's so, the limits uh, of knowledge anyway. <laughs> Obviously we don't really know what it is, so you're free to speculate. So we have an interesting question from Aritra Kundu, uh, who is one of our recent graduates. So Aritra asked that, uh, Adam, you commented on a recent result from ACT about early universe uh, dark is some other form of dark energy in the early universe. Uh, what new information we can get from it if, if it is confirmed by other experiments? From SET? So, um, so SET has this new result that uh, there is this some other form of uh, second type of dark energy. Um, it, it just ah, came out right. in in the, uh, I mean, in recent, I think it came out in uh, last week or the week before. Oh, okay. And well, that, apparent, then this apparent. is an easy question to answer because um, my excuse is I'm in the middle of the semester and I'm busy, but I, I'm probably not as up on recent results as I should be. And I haven't actually seen that result. 
So okay, okay. I, I, I turned already. On I, have to, I have to read the paper carefully. Yeah, I maybe. Uh, yeah, so maybe Aritra thought that you had made some comment about it, but maybe not. Maybe. Yeah, I anyway, don't. I so, haven't seen anything from ACT. I'm sure it's out there, and you're right, but I haven't seen anything in the last. Yeah, I mean, there is a nature. There is a nature uh, sort of article, and uh, so they they find some some particular form of dark. So okay. So I guess that's something that we all have to look up. <laughs> following I'd to, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd want to go away and read it carefully before I had an opinion on it. So now, uh, so Chitana asked that, uh, can we constrain the dark energy equation of state with DAISY? Uh, it's a great question. So for people who got as far as understanding negative pressure for dark energy, um, the equation of state uh, looks like, for dark energy, looks like... Um, the density is related to the pressure with a negative exponent. And what that exponent is would correspond to constraining the equation of state. Um, the answer is a yes, if, if it's, it depends what it is, basically. Uh, in the, the least exciting outcome, which is that it's, it's just the cosmological constant, um, I suspect that that's all we'll be able to say. You know, it, it is the cosmological constant, um, plus or minus some small amount. In the event that there is an admittedly unexpected, but sudden deviation from the behavior of dark energy, so it's not just this smooth flat thing that is kicked in um, at about a redshift of 0 0.7, 0 0.8, then it gets more exciting. Uh, I don't know what that equation of state looks like. I wouldn't want to speculate. Um, so it would be hard to say if we could constrain those changes. Um, but yes, we can constrain the dark energy uh, equation of state. Whether we can do it at a level that is going to say anything interesting and new um, sort of depends on what the dark energy equation of state is. That's great. Thank you, Adam. Fantastic talk. OK. Uh, I actually had a question, which, uh, if you allow me, I'll <laughs> probably ask. Um, so uh, DACY is just one letter away from DES, which is the Dark Energy Survey. But would you say that uh, DACY is more of a successor of EBOS than DES? I would definitely say it's more of a successor uh, of EBOS than DES. This, this plot, again, that I didn't have uh, quite enough time to show, um, moving on too fast, there we go. This wonderful plot from Claire Lamon, this oldie, oldie worldy map of the DESI coverage. So this is our imaging coverage. So where it says MZLS and BASS and decals, that is roughly the Northern hemisphere of the earth. A better way of thinking about it is it's the Northern part of our galaxy. And then where it says decals with DES on the other side, that's sort of, that's in the Southern hemisphere of Earth to observe most of this. Um, and we cheated a little bit. So the line that we will get follow-up spectra for DESI, someone has conveniently put a yellow spot on my screen, but it roughly cuts along the, the, um, the border of decals through that yellow spot and uh, over to the other side. So it does cut through the DES imaging. So we have cheated a little bit and we've stolen some of their imaging. That's not really stealing, but we're using some of their imaging to take spectra, um, to target quasars and galaxies. So although I would definitely say that the technologically and conceptually, this is really, DESI is really the successor of EBOS, DES has done some things, useful things to inform our survey. Okay, um, thank you. So I think uh, we are sort of, I mean, I'll just end with one question, which is sort of looking at the near future. I think we'll all, we should always end with some future talk. So um, uh, Shulabno asked that, uh, Will JWST have any sort of contribution to the kind of observations that you were planning to make? It's, it's, a, it's a good question. So James Webb will, these, these, these sorts of images, James Webb will give amazing images um, and they will be more in the infrared 
than we cover. So you'll get a different color band. Um, and they themselves will be able to make these sorts of plots, uh, these guys, they'll get enough galaxies to be able, well, not spectroscopically, so it'll look like this. They'll get enough galaxies to be able to make these sorts of plots. But I think their overall, um, I, I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think their overall uh, numbers of objects and the regions of the universe they'll be able to cover systematically won't be enough to be competitive with the sorts of measurements Desi's making with spectra. Where they will be useful is there's a whole bunch of other ways to constrain um, the cosmological world model I, I haven't talked about. Like imagine gravitational waves happen and James Webb swings immediately to look at where the gravity, as you know, as uh, I think it's called Kagara is the new Indian, is it Kagara? Is that the Japanese one? Someone help me. No, that's, anyway, the, that's yeah. the Japanese. Yeah. Uh, which which is the Indian one, Suchitana? So in Indian is called the LIGO India because we are LIGO collaborating. That's why I didn't remember it. <laughs> when those gravitational wave detectors come on line, you'll be able to localize where the gravitational wave happened much more precisely. And I'm sure James Webb will try and find ways to follow up those observations to uh, get images of whatever happened um, in the galaxy uh, that caused the gravitational wave. And so there's lots of, and the scope is huge, there's lots of ways the James Webb Space Telescope is going to contribute. Finding the most distant quasars would be fascinating for me, um, which gets at our model of if you're going really, really distant, you're going really back to the earliest times. If you can take, then take follow-up spectra of those quasars, you get all of that hydrogen gas I talked about. You can look at the state of it. Was it neutral? Was it ionized? What was the temperature of the universe? And that gives you a lot of information about the sort of early state of the universe, which is another part of the our model of the universe I didn't talk about at all. So James Webb, I don't think will be directly competitive with large spectroscopic surveys of trying to constrain the cosmological parameters and get at dark energy that way. But it will have lots, it will contribute lots of complementary observations to do with gravitational lensing, follow-up of interesting objects, the most distant galaxies, the most distant quasars that do filter in to our understanding of the universe and cosmology and the cosmological model in other ways. But I don't think it'll be competitive at directly measuring baryon acoustic oscillations. Thank you, Adam. So um, I think uh, we are at the sort of the end of our session. I'll hand over to Gorima uh, now. Gorima, could you please yes, uh, take over? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the illuminating talk and the amazing session. Next is the vote of thanks, which will be conveyed by Shomodip Kundu, who is our UG3 student. Shomodip, please go ahead. Thank you everyone for listening the three days of decision almost. It all started from the Friday and just ending now. Hopefully you have enjoyed all the sessions. We have a very large team who have conducted these events and in the pandemic through the extremely challenging time, we have got a record breaking registrations Nearly 700 registrations we have got, and we have got 17 abstracts and seven, which which were made as a talk in the UG symposium, and we have got seven posters which are shown in the Slack channel also. You can visit our Slack channel after the summit, and it is open to all. On Friday we have got the, the public stick figure. Our former student Subhajyoti B, who is now a JRF fellow in IIT Delhi. And today we have got Professor Adam D. Myers as a public speech speaker. We are thankful to them for their precious time in their busy schedule. In this summit, the highlights of, of it was the ruminating with alumni session. We are thankful to our alumni. Namrata Roy, Shoumo Roy, Unmesh Ghorai, Pratyusabha Waral, 
for their precious time. And we also thank Ovinanda Chakraborty to moderate that session. We have get a great idea about the career of physics. We, we have also got to know about the future of physics in our panel discussion session by Professor Tithankar Roy Choudhury, Professor Urbosi Sina, and Professor Rajiv Sensharma. We are thankful to them. I also thank Professor Suchadana Tatarji to moderate that session in a very short notice. I also thank our faculties for their support in making the whole summit successful. I am thankful to our SOC members for selecting some marvelous abstracts. Sainil Molla, Shubhajyoti Bid, Aritya Kundu, Gorima Rajguru, Nagonita Das, Moitra Kundu, Samrat Roy, Chauvik Chatterjee, Ognibo Dotto. I thank you for your guidance for organizing the event successfully. I also thank you the AOC members who also served as the chairs of different sessions. Oishwarya Tarokdar, Indira Dolui, Sheikh Nasi Mali, Devanin Mukhavadhyay, Sagnik Roy, Shovik Sarkar. Without your great support, these events cannot be possible. I also like to thank Deepsa Das, Samra Roy, Shovik Chatterji, Moitra Kundu for organizing the quiz and also chairing other events. Thank you all for your email support. Thank you for managing the online management, publicity, and logistics. This summit also cannot be possible without the financial support. From the inception, we are getting assistance from our alumni and faculty members. I am thanking you once again. Good night. Hopefully, we will get next year again. Okay, thank you, Shomadip. And uh, thank you, Adam, again. And uh, I think we are now leaving, right? Leaving the session. Yes, sir. Yes, and uh, three chairs to all the organizers for such three wonderful days of the uh, yes. Precision thank Academic you. Fest. So a yes. big clap to everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Adam Myers, for you know coming from, you know, joining us from, I, mean, I think Adam left, but yeah, I, I have already told that to him. This was fascinating. Thank you. Can we now end the meeting for all or uh, yes, so maybe we should yes, yes ma'am. Can you stop yes, the live YouTube?